continuing the theme of technology, it's now time for the first panel session of the day. Um, here we're going to be discussing the future of spectrum management. An important part of this is spectrum sharing, and we're going to be digging into that in a lot more detail. It's also a lot more than spectrum sharing, though. Technology will play a key part in spectrum management, and the panel will explore technology and the roles it can play in improving how we manage spectrum use more broadly. Also, as well, the role regulators have here is essential. Uh, what do we think best practice should look like and how does technology play into that debate are important questions. We have a fantastic panel for you today, bringing viewpoints from regulators, vendors and operators. So to start with, I'd like to ask each of the panel members to introduce themselves and give us a few opening remarks to set the scene. So firstly, Maro, please take the stage. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me for giving some thoughts on uh, this uh, issue. I will uh, touch uh, the issue of spectrum sharing. So uh, after uh, the magic word uh, showed us by Bruno, uh, it's sad that uh, I have to uh, bring you back to the boredom of uh, regulation. <laughs> Someone should uh, make this, uh, this job anyway. Uh, also to make uh, those magic uh, uh, to happen or to favor those magic to uh, go on the market. So I, I am with the Italian regulator, but uh, today I'm speaking also on behalf of the uh, RSPG, the Radio Spectrum uh, Policy Group, uh, advisor for the member states and the European Commission. Uh, next, next slide. Well, uh, I guess you all know more or less the work, the RSPG work program for uh, this year and, and the next. It's available on, on our website anyhow. And it's not the first time that RSPG deals with the uh, spectrum sharing. We have a long history of work on uh, that issue. Uh, and I point to the uh, re last year report on the European spectrum strategy. Uh, where we said that the spectrum uh, sharing is one of the six pillars for the coming year strategy and it, ne it needs uh, further action. And to make a long story short, uh, what we would like to achieve is uh, making uh, uh, more spectrum sharing in the future, uh, possibly by recommending you a roadmap, some uh, trials, uh, some trials to experience uh, spectrum sharing and technical and architectural advances as well. So uh, RSPG decided to devote uh, time and people for this task and established uh, a subgroup that I have the honor to chair together with a colleague from uh, the Spanish Ministry for Digital. And an opinion uh, on that is expected by June uh, next year. Uh, one of the main points I want to make right now to anticipate the conclusion is that uh, technology, and Chris, you mentioned uh, technology uh, especially, a technology for us uh, regulators is just a mean, a, an enabler for spectrum sharing, for uh, fostering uh, more efficient, and more innovative sharing approaches. But um, as regulators, uh, we are and must be technology neutral. At the end of the day, we must abide by the, by the rules. We must follow the code. So the new ECC is the master reference for us. And there, there are uh, only two forms forms of spectrum use. Uh, one is licensed and one is by means of general authorizations. Unlicensed or license exempt are synonyms of general uh, authorization, since actually any radio device should be uh, authorized in some way, directly or uh, indirectly. Given that, uh, we should uh, explore ways to be more flexible, providing the right mix of authorizations, exploiting the technologies, uh, but providing rules for sharing uh, in two cases. Uh, um, first, when uh, rights of use are granted uh, for the first time, and, second, and secondly, by favoring market agreements, when uh, uh, sharing uh, comes at market players' initiative. Next slide. Okay, uh, given that uh, the work of our uh, group started in February and luckily the pandemic has not stopped the activity, uh, yet of course uh, we are still at the beginning of, uh, of our work. So unfortunately I won't be able 
today to give final answer to uh, to all the questions that may uh, rise, may be rise. Uh, but um, what um, so what what are we going uh, to do uh, right now? Uh, we are so far framing spectrum sharing in all the various uh, aspects and dimensions. Because you know, spectrum sharing uh, is a complicated issue. May mean different things to different stakeholders, uh, different to different players. If you are an MNO, a mobile network operator, you may be seeing uh, sharing in a more traditional uh, way: uh, inter-service sharing between peers or geographical sharing, uh, static sharing. Uh, while if you are a newcomer uh, uh, or a new actor in the value chain, su such as a vertical, you may need uh, a different way of sharing spectrum. Maybe you only need a 5G, 5G slice. And if you are an end user, you, you just need to use a device and you don't care whether it is licensed or, uh, or not. Uh, while we as regulators, we have to assess all different possible scenarios, all different bands and combinations. And as I said, um, find the right mix to satisfy the various uh, demands. So we are analyzing right now all different technologies and approaches that are quite a lot and uh, uh, even uh, increasing over time. It's true, we are pushed by technologies. It's a matter of fact, you, you can have many good ideas, uh, but in the end it's the technologies, the technology that uh, does realize those ideas. And we have to pave the way to make things happen, try to be for looking. In, in this sense, some, approach, uh, some approaches based of, uh, on a new, uh, a new ideas, new uh, buzzwords such as artificial intelligence or uh, blockchain seem promising. But uh, we, have, uh, we have still to deepen something about that and see whether they can uh, work uh, effectively. And we are also collecting some experiences. So, um, Chris, you mentioned the best practice. The, um, many, many things are happening right now in Europe, and not only there are interesting experiences in many countries, France, Czech Republic, Finland, UK, Italy as well, and uh, we should exploit those. And also we want to collect dedicated inputs. We will uh, um, foresee a public consultation uh, uh, later in the process. Uh, next slide. So main, main steering points, I will be very brief on that. Uh, first, we have to uh, respond to the increasing demands of Spectrum uh, coming by new operators, uh, new users, new industries. And we have to uh, answer to those by e exploiting and increasing Spectrum sharing. Of course, from a policy perspective, uh, there are other ways to, to do that, but now we are talking about uh, sharing. Second, we want to raise the bar for considering exclusive use the norm, as traditionally is, it is done. Uh, identify a new band, vacate it, uh, or keep some limited incumbent, then issue exclusive rights. It's the tradition, this. But uh, of course, we, uh, we know that uh, exclusive use has, has uh, its benefit. We don't, don't deny it, but we want more proof to be convinced of that. And um, I skip the details. Um, and um, finally, we want to get uh, as much experience as, uh, as, uh, as possible on the field cases, of course, and of the trials to, to see the real benefits. Because uh, uh, I, I want to say that the technology is not an end in, in itself. Something, I, I, want, I'm, I say that something that is good in the academy or, uh, or in a lab, uh, may not be uh, good uh, in the field where operators are struggling uh, to provide the services with the right quality of service and possibly make also uh, pro profit, profits from that. So we are aware of that and the idea is to uh, improve but, but not uh, uh, disrupt. Next slide. Um, so uh, I, um, we want to exploit a, a number of, uh, a number of uh, uh, approaches, uh, 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 and th this is uh, one of the, the category of approaches, the DSA, uh, but I, I want to say that uh, technology for spectrum sharing uh, uh, is complex and uh, it can easily escape any attempt of putting them into categories. It's, it's like to say that each case is a category per se. However, there are some common grounds and this uh, DSA is uh, one of those. I want to be, uh, get into uh, the detail now. 
Uh, so to, to, to conclude, uh, what uh, are we going uh, to do over the next months? Uh, as, I, as I say, um, uh, uh, right now we are, uh, we are collecting the various uh, uh, issues, the various technologies and approaches and experiences. And we are considering uh, how mature are those technologies and, uh, and how uh, good are the experiences. And then we have to identify number of bands, both already assigned for ECS or, or, uh, and new, new bands. We'll have to consider uh, the possibility to trial on these bands to test those new approaches. And in general, we would like to introduce some uh, flexible measure. Um, at the moment, the rights of use of spectrum are uh, uh, assigned for, for the first time. But of course, we would also like to favor uh, sharing agreements uh, when those are put forward at market player uh, players uh, initiative of course uh, safeguarding uh, competition issues and uh, also abiding by the rule uh, rules as i said and uh, I, I can say that we are we have promising experiences popping out in europe right now and a lot of material to to work uh, to work on uh, so that's all uh, from my side for, for now, and I'll give back the floor to, uh, to Chris. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Mario. Some fascinating points there that I will be able to dig into in a minute. Um, secondly, could I um, introduce Don, please? Take the stage. Good morning. Uh, my name is Don Stockdale, and I'm chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau at the U.S. Federal Communications Commission. During my few minutes, I would like to provide some background for our discussion today by first describing the basic challenge that wireless providers and regulators face today with respect to spectrum management. And second, sketching some of the tools and approaches carriers and regulators have adopted to meet this growing challenge. So the basic challenge is that the demand for wireless data and therefore for spectrum continues to grow exponentially while the supply of spectrum is fixed. Now, technological innovations, including those made by equipment manufacturers, have helped to a considerable extent. For example, the move from analog to digital or the technological innovations that made millimeter wave bands usable for fixed and mobile broadband are extremely helpful. But these technological innovations alone have not been enough. So what have providers and regulators done? Well, they have developed a number of tools or techniques for using spectrum more efficiently. And these can be grouped into two broad classes. First, spectrum repurposing to allow new, more valuable uses of the spectrum to replace older, less valuable uses. And second, spectrum sharing under which different uses or providers share the same spectrum. Now, there are at least three re ways that regulators, or at least the FCC, have encouraged spectrum repurposing. First, the commission has generally adopted flexible licensing rules, either as an initial matter or as a subsequent update, so that licensees can seamlessly adopt improved technologies as they are introduced and thus make more efficient use of the spectrum. Second, in some cases, FCC has conducted overlay auctions and then given the incumbent licensees a specified period to relocate to another specified band. And third, more recently, the FCC has been confronted with more complicated cases. For example, a couple of years ago, the commission developed a two-sided incentive auction in which in the reverse auction, existing licensees, that is the TV broadcasters, could relinquish their spectrum rights in exchange for a portion of the value of those rights. And in the forward auction, um, uh, mobile companies could bid for new flexible use licenses. And then last year, the commission conducted a one-sided incentive auction for the 39 gigahertz band. Uh, finally, I note that it, it is frequently harder to repurpose spectrum that is controlled by government entities. Sometimes, however, repurposing is infeasible, 
either because it would be too expensive to move the incumbents or because there is no appropriate spectrum available to wh which they can be moved. In those cases, regulators have turned to various forms of spectrum sharing. In some cases, regulators have adopted a cosine approach and allowed private parties to negotiate sharing arrangements. Thus, for example, the FCC allows geographic licensees to partition their licenses, that is, divide them geographically, or disaggregate them, split them spectrally. Uh, and the FCC has also adopted rules to streamline leasing of spectrum licenses. Transaction costs, coordination problems, and strategic behavior may thwart private negotiations, however. So in many cases, regulators have intervened to encourage spectrum sh sharing, including geographic, spectral, and temporal sharing. For example, in the US, the FCC has frequently licensed geographic licenses using relatively small geographic licensing areas to encourage geographic sharing, and licensees can then further partition their licenses. As an example of temporal sharing in the U.S., AM radio station may operate on a daytime, limited time, or unlimited time basis. In other cases, such as bands used for point-to-point -point services, the commission has relied on third-party coordinators. Regulators can also encourage sharing by establishing different priority levels for different uses, where the lower priority users cannot operate in a way that causes adverse interference in the prior, higher priority use. Recently, however, technology has opened up new opportunities for dynamic sharing. In the case of the 3.5 gigahertz band, the commission adopted three priority levels. First, incumbent users, primarily military radars, receive the highest priority. Second, Priority access licensees, licenses, or PALs, receive second level priority. And third, general authorized access, or GAA users, receive the lowest priority. The commission then set up a certification process under which private parties could develop and operate highly automated frequently, frequency control coordination systems known as spectrum access systems, or SASs, and environmental capability systems, or ESCs, which move lower priority users to another channel, or if necessary, shut them down when higher priority users are operating in a particular area. And in April of this year, the FCC adopted another form of dynamic sharing for the six gigahertz band, which previously was used by microwave service providers, among other incumbents. And we may discuss that during the question and answer proceeding. Finally, I note that uh, the FCC also encourages sharing between satellite operators and terrestrial users in certain millimeter wave bands through soft segmentation of spectrum or geographic sharing. And uh, let me conclude by noting that one lesson I hope you will take away from this short survey is that regulators and users have a number of tools to encourage more efficient spectrum usage, but that technology has opened up a whole new set of tools that regulators can employ. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Don. That's an excellent foil to uh, some of um, uh, Maro's comments there. Uh, Mahanid, can I hand over the stage to you next, please? Thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everybody. My name is Mohanad Jawad, and I'm representing ISSAWAR. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ISSAWAR, it's a non-governmental, uh, non-profit organization uh, with 21 uh, satellite operators as members. Uh, the key objective is to serve and promote the common interests of the satellite operators. Um, today, I'd like to give you just a perspective from the satellite industry and how uh, spectrum sharing is an element of our day-to-day -day, um, uh, work basis. Um, it's a classic case when you come to the satellite industry of a, um, the analogy of out of sight, out of mind. Uh, 
Uh, however, uh, satellite uh, services are crucial. They play a vital role every day to provide critical services, whether it's for TV transmission, um, uh, providing connectivity to uh, enterprise broadband services, um, connectivity to airplanes, ships, cars, trains, you name it. And with this said, uh, I think that today we as satellite industry do a good job of actually sharing spectrum. Um, we have a long history of, of doing that uh, with um, geo uh, stationary satellite operators sharing spectrum between two to three degrees, sometimes even within the same orbital uh, location. Um, if you move lower from the geo arc, uh, satellite uh, spectrum is being shared today between geo satellite operators and non geo satellite operators, such as MEOs or low Earth uh, uh, orbits, such as LEOs. Um, and then if you come down even lower to the ground, many satellite, um, satellite bands are actually shared on an individually coordinated basis with point-to-point uh, -point terrestrial fixed services. Uh, take an example, uh, Futstad, one of the largest teleports in Germany, is actually being shared today between the satellite and, and the fixed services uh, in the same geolocation. Um, and then even further from, from, from that technology, uh, we had the presentation by Bruno earlier about ILAN and Wi-Fi. Um, satellite bands will be sharing uh, with Wi-Fi systems in the 6 gigahertz. There is a, a, a framework being developed in Europe today, um, and satellite operators are involved in that framework. And also, we heard about the framework in the United States. So sharing takes a number of forms when it comes to the satellite industry and other technologies. However, uh, sharing between ubiquitously deployed satellite services and terrestrial mobile services has uh, today proven uh, not to be feasible. Um, there's a lot of challenges uh, to be um, had there. Namely, the signals from the satellite in space is already relatively weak by the time it reaches the Earth. Uh, if you just take uh, an example, the satellite receiver needs to decode a signal that's traveling uh, from space uh, of a distance of about 36,000 kilometers away. So the power by the time it reaches the Earth's a receiver is very low. And if you compare that to a terrestrial 5G base station, which is nearby, uh, it in many cases overwhelms and saturates the RF equipment on, on the uh, 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 satellite receiver. So there is some challenges when it comes to that particular technology between satellite and, and mobile. And now we're seeing uh, with 5G um, uh, being introduced around the world, this challenge is, is particularly important uh, to regulators to the industry as well. Um, we're seeing from different regulators various uh, spectrum sharing initiatives being looked at, like the FCC CPRS, Ofcom's innovative sharing scheme as well. So we're involved in that to see how that will be developed. Um, but from our industry, I think the key message is that regulatory certainty is very important. And this is because of the amount of uh, time the, the procurement of these satellites and the amount of time that they are in space is well beyond 15 years. So this certainty of re regulatory is very vital in order to uh, spearhead the innovation that's happening in our industry, such as technologies in improving the payload of uh, the satellites. We're used to traditional bend pipe uh, technology, but now we're seeing high throughput satellite technologies able to have a digital processor on the payload to efficiently use the spectrum to make sure that sharing is, is, is more adequate uh, between the, the satellite operators and also to provide the required bandwidth if there is a peak or a surge in demand in certain geographical areas. Another element of innovation in our technology uh, in our industry is the ability to develop uh, on the ground side phase array technology so that um, it enables the antennas to efficiently use better spectrum and it enables applications such as uh, in motion terminals. So uh, taking that into account, I think the key message from, from our industry at least is that we require this regulatory certainty to make sure that um, the procurement of the satellites for the future, not just the medium term, but the long term is available. And with that, I conclude my uh, uh, comments. Thank you.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mohanad. And um, you know, I, I think the point about satellites being out of sight, and um, we often forget how much sharing goes on between the uh, the different orbits and down on the Earth. Um, next, Jennifer, please, can you uh, introduce yourself? Thank you. Hi, Chris. Thank you. Yes, this is Jennifer McCarthy. I'm the Vice President of Legal Advocacy for Federated Wireless, uh, which is headquartered here in the United States. Uh, we are one of the Spectrum Access System administrators uh, for the 3.5 gigahertz CBRS band that Don mentioned earlier, uh, where uh, we are implementing our cloud-based automated uh, spectrum sharing technology to enable sharing of 150 megahertz of critical mid-band um, 5G spectrum between a variety of incumbents as well as between uh, new users, new uh, terrestrial mobile broadband users. Um, these incumbents include the military radar systems that Don mentioned, fixed satellite service earth stations, um, as well as grandfathered broadband wireless licensees who are converting from older FCC rules uh, that they've been operating on a lightly licensed basis for the past 15 years and are converting over to the new CBRS rules uh, where they will be uh, able to use the GAA, General Authorized Access Tier of Spectrum, and or participate in the FCC's upcoming priority access license uh, auction, which is going to start on July 23rd. We are also a prospective six gigahertz um, automated frequency controller or AFC administrator, uh, both in the United States and hopefully around the world. Um, that uh, sharing scheme is gonna be a little bit less complicated than what's going on in CBRS, given that most of the incumbent users are fixed and are, their locations are known and their operating parameters are well known. So we don't need to incorporate some of the sensing technologies that we're using in CBRS to detect the mobile radars that are uh, on ships um, along the coasts. Uh, so it will be a simpler, um, easier uh, sharing scheme to implement, but one that nonetheless relies on the very same cloud-based automated capability that we've developed for the 3.5 band. So while we are uh, commercial, we've been up and running for nine months now, um, and we are successfully enabling what, as I said, is a, is a pretty complicated set of sharing conditions for this band, but it's uh, been really impressive to see um, how much deployment has occurred only in the, uh, the nine months that we've been um, up and running. Um, as an industry, there are over 25,000 base stations already deployed uh, with hundreds more coming on each week. Uh, very exciting to see uh, uh, all of this deployment, particularly in uh, you know, this difficult time with uh, COVID-19. Uh, I think it just shows the, the pent up demand for mid-band spectrum and the fact that there are different access options available for a variety of folks to, uh, to participate in, in this spectrum band. Um, if we look at what's going, uh, who's applied to participate in the upcoming PAL auction, you'll see that it's a wide variety of companies, uh, both in terms of their size as well as the industry uh, that they're uh, primarily focused on. You've got all the big mobile network operators, our cable television um, and internet service providers are also going to uh, be participating. You have a whole bunch of wireless internet service providers, telcos, uh, energy and utility companies, educational institutions, as well as a variety of enterprises, um, particularly industrial users who are looking to deploy private networks on the spectrum. And having the ability to choose whether to go through the general authorized unlicensed tier or participate in the PAL auction and have a license themselves, uh, th those options are really opening up the, uh, the market for, uh, for spectrum and, and how it can be used. We're also excited about what's gonna happen in the six gigahertz band. Um, I know we're gonna be talking uh, more extensively about that later today, but uh, we, we will be helping to administer the sharing scheme for standard power access points, as well as any access point that is uh, 
uh, deployed outdoors. We think this um, will provide a lot more flexibility for the Wi-Fi community and the 5G unlicensed community to really meet uh, consumer demands and that it would um, you know, be a, a benefit uh, for other countries to consider the use of an AFC system to enable uh, similar sharing and provide additional operational flexibility and maximize the spectrum options for the new entrants while um, continuing to ensure the protection of the incumbents. We also think this technology could be extremely relevant for the 3.8 to 4.2 gigahertz band uh, that uh, Europe, um, the United States and others are uh, starting to implement for 5G. Uh, we've already demonstrated that sharing with fixed satellite services is feasible and uh, uh, can protect those services from the mobile terrestrial operations. So we look forward to working with uh, folks throughout Europe and uh, around the world in figuring out how we can uh, leverage all of the technology development and experience we've gained um, in other frequency bands uh, to 3.8 to 4.2. Chris, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, examples of technology actually in action at the moment, um, which should be great to explore a little bit more later. And then finally, um, Gosta, um, please have the floor and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Gosta Lemne. I work for Ericsson in business development. Uh, I'm particularly heading into uh, spectrum technology and spectrum strategy of various kinds. Uh, I'll try to be brief to leave some room for the discussions, but what I want to start here is spectrum sharing in the context of 5G. What does it mean? Because spectrum sharing is not new. As everybody has said, it's been around for quite some time. It could be static, it could be dynamic, etc. television, white space, etc. But 5G is. And 5G offers a number of new promises that must be taken into account when you work about with uh, shared spectrum. The most revolutionary part of 5G is probably the robustness, including then guaranteed low latency, uh, high data rates guaranteed, etc. We're talking about 99.999% uh, security or robustness in the tech industries, etc. to um, starting trials. And also some of them are already in operation using 5G. Uh, that's industries, that's harbors, that's hospitals, etc. But also remote control of equipment in the areas where 5G is already launched. Um, and as also mentioned by more by Bruno and others, that there's no way we can anticipate where this is going because once you have a fully secure connection with a very low latency, that's a lot of stuff you can't do. We didn't imagine fully the smartphone either when we launched 3G in the beginning of the century. But then on to sharing. Uh, today there are some 20 nations worldwide that I know of that have either decided on some level of spectrum sharing specifically for 5G services or have consultations or discussions ongoing. Uh, details of differ a lot. I think they should because prerequisites are different. And also it might be that different nations have different priority applications in mind. So that's good. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that in order for 5G to deliver on the robustness, the ability to control drones or agricultural equipment, run industries, hospitals, etc., the access to spectrum must also be guaranteed. You can't expect a hospital or an industry to slow down because they one day get less spectrum than they thought they would have. So predictability is the key requirement. That is for if you're talking about industries or hospitals or harbors, we're talking about decades of planning. Uh, if you talk about temporary things like uh, the sport setup or a uh, rock concert like Woodstock or something, uh, even though you only use it for a couple of weeks or days, but you need to be able to plan. So. Predictability, I think, is the most important thing that's new with 5G that we have to think about when we talk about and introduce sharing for 5G. Another aspect that's worthwhile noting, I think, is that today we are used to having 
most of the dense traffic in the highly populated areas, which is natural because it's mostly people talking to each other. But with 5G, when you have the chance to remotely monitor and control stuff on a very long distance, agriculture, machines, drones, whatever. Uh, so also the more remote they are, the higher the need for this ability to run things remotely. So we have to exp expect changes in the traditional concept of where the high traffic are. It's not necessarily just the high populated areas. Then of course, the list of stuff that a regulator must think about when introducing, uh, when managing spectrum and introducing sharing is as long as it has always been. And I have great respect for regulators working with this. There are lots of challenges, including preventing spectrum hoarding, uh, excessive first mover advantage. You have to remember that not everybody, not all industries will start using 5G at the same time. It will come over the years and that has to be taken into account. At the same time, you want to keep it as simple as possible. And you got to think about things like environmental things, like if you, if you force somebody to, to be able to move over a wide spectrum while they only use a fraction of it at any time, then of course the equipment, the base stations, etc., will be heavier, they will be bigger, they will cost more, and they will have a lower power. Uh, the, the power conversion ratio, that is, they will consume more power. So there's even a carbon dioxide angle to this that has to be taken into account. Finally, one thing, and that is also not new, but when we're talking about maximizing spectrum efficiency, uh, of course, the most efficient way is to have just one network, everything in the same network, because all of these handling of interference, optimizing the use of spectrum. They're inherent in a four or 5G network. And it's very difficult to do anything better than that because it's uh, managed on a millisecond level. As soon as you start sharing, as soon as you divide it into smaller areas, you will have the same type of border issues as between nations, meaning that there are, will be interference or there will be areas with unused spectrum. And that's fine. It's just something to note that if you're looking for maximum spectrum efficiency, wide area coverage from nationwide players or something like that can always take you to the better end. If you do sharing geographically with small areas particularly, then it's important that those players have a chance to know each other. You need to know your spectrum neighbors because you can actually use the same spectrum inside to adjacent factories because they typically both have walls could be brick walls could be concrete could be uh, metallic walls etc and the only thing they have to think about is to make sure that they don't mount the base stations so that there is a direct line through the openings in those two factories and straight into the other one otherwise it works just fine but you need to know then who is the guy working with the same band and that's not practically possible if you move them around on a daily basis or something. Of course, it can be reformed. Of course, it can be moved. But you need to give them half a year or 18 months or something so that they can make those changes and make new deals with their new spectrum neighbors. And that's another thing to bear in mind if you really want to maximize the spectrum efficiency. But back to where I started, predictability. If spectrum access is not predictable, then there's no 5G robustness that can guarantee those five nines and that can help you run your virtual reality or remote drones or industries, etc., uh, with enough level of security. I think I'll stop there because, as I said, I think the debate will be more interesting than listening to us one by one. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gotham. And um, really flag out the importance of regulatory certainty and stability there. Right, um, we've had quite a few questions coming in. We've got some poll results coming in as well. Just before we get to all that, I think I'll kick off with a little bit of a um, uh, easy one for everyone, just to start sort of framing the landscape. Here. And um, a lot of you mentioned the different technologies and methods currently available to promote spectrum sharing or spectrum. And I just wonder whether we could pick out of those a little bit more or a flag certain ones they're particularly interested in, just so we can map out that. I 
I'm sorry we can't hear you, Chris. Oh, you can't hear me. Yeah. No, we just said horrible a little um, bit, so we missed the question. Okay, right, let me repeat the question then. Um, so just to start off with, I wonder if we sort of try and map out the landscape a little bit of some of the technologies and methods, um, just to provide a baseline before we start digging into the detail and issue. And um, what kind of methods would you like to identify in particular that are currently available to promote spectrum sharing or spectrum efficiency? You want to go one by one or? Yeah, let's, um, let's start with you, Don, since you... Um, Okay, uh, so, uh, I think that's a good way to start because there clearly are a huge number of tools that both market participants, equipment manufacturers, and regulators can use to make uh, spectrum use more efficient. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it's a case that providers and equipment manufacturers are constantly developing new technologies that allow providers to get more out of a particular amount of spectrum, uh, such as greater compression technologies. And we need to encourage those as regulators and not uh, through uh, our rules uh, prevent these uh, upgrades. Uh, in addition, uh, there are uh, uh, ways that uh, the uh, regulators can encourage repurposing where it's too expensive, where uh, there, one use is clearly more valuable than another, and the uh, incumbent users may be persuaded to uh, move to another area. And if that's not possible, then we can use uh, sharing, which uh, does raise some issues in terms of, uh, in some cases, being more costly or creating the need to deal with adjacent band or adjacent area uh, interference issues. Uh, but I think the technology is uh, uh, moving forward on a number of fronts and that uh, it's important for regulators and uh, market participants to be able to take advantage of those as a uh, technology evolves. Thank you. Um, I can jump in there. Again, would you um, intervene? Yes, okay. please. Yes. We're asking for me. Yeah. <laughs> More, many speakers in the air. Well, I think Don has covered it all. I mean, you can talk about moving things in, in and out, you can talk about uh, sharing in time, sharing in space. You can talk about uh, fixed sharing or a uh, dynamic sharing. And that dynamic sharing can also be in several layers, as Jennifer described. So, I mean, you have all of those tools. Uh, I have to decide depending on what you want to do. And that's sort of where I started in the sense that if you want those five nines, those five nines will only be available when Spectrum is fully guaranteed. If you have a dynamic Incumbent like CBRS, you don't, you're not guaranteed any spectrum at all, actually, if the dynamic incumbent is asking for it to get it back. So uh, that's one of the last bit you have to be careful with when the incumbents are, are uh, dynamic. One good thing about most of those sharing tool supports is that if you communicate, all technologies get sold. Give a decade and you want to move them out there. They're sort of disturbing everybody. And uh, if you have a license spectrum, someone is paying for it, they will automatically go from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4 to 5, etc., because it makes sense to them. Uh, if it's a completely unlicensed band, there's no way of removing stuff that is 30 years old. You can still turn on a walkie talkie and block an entire band. Uh, but if you have a system, where you have some kind of authorization ongoing all the time, then you can force those obsolete stuff to just a part of the band and reuse the band in a more uh, spectrum efficient way using more new technology. So knowing where your unlicensed stuff is and being able to control it, that's an asset, at least 10 years from now, when you want to do something new. 
Thank you, Costa. And uh, Maro, if I could bring you in there. Sorry, yeah. I was um, uh, missed your hand waving a second. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, I'm fully in line with what, with what uh, Don and Yosta um, just uh, just said. I mean, uh, um, I, I'm speaking uh, now as a regulator more than a, a RSPG. Uh, uh, spectrum sharing is a very complex issue for, uh, for a regulator. Uh, you have, at the same time, uh, um, uh, cope with the, with the legacy situation you have and at the same at the same time uh, thinking uh, uh, at the future uh, at the uh, being uh, for looking so uh, all the technologies uh, we uh, we are talking in right now are just uh, as i said before uh, uh, just uh, tools for us uh, and and then uh, answering also one of the question raised from the audience uh, I don't see a uh, one size fit, fits all uh, uh, solution. Uh, on the contrary, each each situation has a, um, has, uh, has a merits a different uh, uh, approach. Uh, for instance, uh, if, if you uh, if you are a, a, a mobile operator, then you uh, you have to uh, to probably uh, leave uh, um, sharing agreements between uh, between. Uh, uh, between them and and, uh, um, uh, and also paving the way for for them to propose uh, to propose uh, their agreements because maybe you you cannot uh, force them to make uh, for example spectrum pooling or, or not uh, maybe spectrum pooling is uh, is good for rural uh, rural uh, more rural areas but not for for um, uh, populated uh, city. Uh, then another issue is when uh, there is a, 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 a new band that is uh, used by an incumbent, and you want to keep the incumbent and uh, have uh, the band be shared by newcomers that are peers between them. Another issue is when the band is totally totally free. So each each case has a, a different um, uh, has different possibility. Uh, um, as a, a regulator, I I would not like uh, to impose any technology, any kind of sharing, any any constraint. I would like to work uh, from a market player initiative uh, in the, in the licensed bands, or uh, for the new bands, uh, also uh, speak to the, the good uh, um, harmonization process that we have in, in Europe. We don't start from uh, from uh, um, from day one, and we, we don't start immediately. I mean, uh, there is a long process of study of the band made by um, stand, standardization organizations such as ETSI or compatibility study made by CPT. Then we have a process of harmonization at EU level. So, Everything is uh, very well, uh, very well uh, um, studied, and uh, when it comes to uh, assignment, we have also uh, we have the, the, the road well, well uh, uh, straight for, for uh, our decision. So I, I see Great, thank you. Uh, all, all uh, the various tools and we, uh, uh, our armaments, uh, weaponry that we have to use for the various cases. Excellent. Uh, Mohamed, if I'll hand over to you, please. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, I agree with the uh, with the previous speaker that um, it, spectrum sharing is very complicated, um, and I think this has resonated with the other speakers as well. One size does not fit all. Um, Jennifer mentioned that the FSS with, with deployment in, in the US uh, has shown that sharing is feasible. Uh, there are different dynamics at play in different markets, different regions that allow for this to happen. But like you said, one size does not fit all. So in one uh, particular country, it might be possible, but in other regions and other uh, types of applications where it's received only TVROs on top of buildings and so on from the satellite perspective, uh, sometimes uh, there is a lot of challenges to be had uh, in order to provide that coexistence. Um, and I'd like to just touch on maybe on the dynamic spectrum sharing uh, anyway, because I think it was one of um, the highest scoring in, in, the, in the polls that was uh, put up uh, during the uh, panel discussion. Uh, I think dynamically shared spectrum 
may not always provide the required certainty to support investment, especially from the satellite in, uh, perspective. Uh, because when you're building new satellites and the associated ground infrastructure, you're looking at a long 15 plus year period to provide that regulatory certainty. And that regulatory certainty has also resonated with some of the speakers from both industries, whether it's terrestrial or, or the satellite. Um, so, for example, spectrum sensing techniques have obvious limitations as a tool to manage interference into uh, satellite downlink receivers. The efficiency, efficiency of geolocation or databases uh, also require testing to ensure their availability to control interference resource uh, sources. So where uh, the jury is out there, I think, to see how that's going to play out. Um, so I think with uh, DSS or dynamic spectrum sharing, uh, from our point of view, uh, it's mainly targeting to provide flexibility to the terrestrial services. Uh, we don't see any direct benefits today from the satellite services perspective. But like I said, the jury is still out. Um, and I did mention in, in my introduction about how satellite is, is uh, able to share spectrum today. I think uh, seeing that from other industries as well, uh, the ability to share the spectrum would be a way forward, definitely for for the future as well, if it's possible. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, Jennifer, you sort of add in, please. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Chris. Um, no, I agree with the previous speakers. Uh, one one size does not fit all, and that's kind of the beauty of this technology is that it can be applied in a variety of instances to solve different challenges. Um, you know, the CBRS situation in the United States might be one of the most complicated uh, situations, as I mentioned, uh, where we're dealing with so many different uh, types of incumbents, as well as multiple tiers of new users. Um, but, you know, it's up, it's working, it's feasible, and it shows um, sort of the, the wide range of capability that this technology can uh, be applied to. But there are much um, simpler ways of, of uh, parsing out, whether it's dealing with one incumbent that happens to be a government user or a different incumbent such as satellite service uh, that's being used on a commercial basis, or if you're in a clear band and you want to enable different, um, different tiers of access, whether it's a guaranteed uh, more exclusive access for those applications like Austin mentioned that require um, predictability or if you're able to um, isolate yourself geographically and rely on um, uh, the predictability that's associated with that isolation, that's also a possibility. Um, but what's great about the technology is that it can adapt to uh, changing incumbent uses as well as changing new users. It, it does not have to be a fixed static situation for all time. Um, it's also flexible in terms of what it can allow uh, for um, licensees to possibly um, make their spectrum available to other users on a secondary market basis. Uh, for example, in the United States, the FCC has put in place in the CBRS band a use it or share it requirement, meaning that the PAL licensees don't actually have a fully exclusive right to the spectrum that they're purchasing, but they've got the first in time right to go ahead and, and use that spectrum. Um, but what I think that's going to do is uh, incentivize them to make their spectrum available to other users on the secondary market, generate some revenues from any unused spectrum that they have, and uh, take credit for that uh, deployment by a lessee, for example, towards their build-out requirements under the FCC's rules. Um, and we, as one of the spectrum access system administrators, are going to be creating a marketplace to enable that uh, secondary use uh, to occur very efficiently. Sort of like the Airbnb or vacation rental by owner um, uh, equivalent for Spectrum, where an inventory of a variety of uh, uh, Spectrum options could be available to someone who needs short-term uh, access to Spectrum, but they want the predictability of having a lease rather than using the more unlicensed portion. Or this could be for longer term relationships where a mobile network operator only plans to deploy in an urban or suburban market and can make the um, more rural parts of their spectrum available for wireless internet service providers who uh, want to target those markets. So the technology really has an amazing uh, flexibility to address incumbency issues 
different challenges about spectrum access for new entrants, and then looking at ways to um, make the most uh, efficient use out of spectrum and help generate uh, new business models uh, for, for a variety of licensees and users. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think one thing coming out of that for me is pretty much across the board, everyone recognizes that one size does not fit all. And I just want to pull up one of the polls now, because I think this is really interesting. And this is about introducing and using new technology for spectrum management. And the question was, should regulators be doing more, doing less, or doing the same? And overwhelmingly, with a high enough percentage to change the constitution, 70% said regulators should be doing more. Uh, only 6% said they should be doing less. And about 23% staying the same. So it seems there's a huge appetite for regulators to be doing more there. So just on the back of that, I wonder if I could ask you all, and if I could go first to the two regulators on the panel, which elements of the regulator's spectrum management process are most likely for, to benefit from the introduction of new tools and new technologies? And then we'll come to the uh, vendors and operators next. So uh, Mauro, if I could start with you, we'll go around the clock. Uh, I am, as a regulator, I am quite happy of the tools I have uh, right now for uh, doing my job that is mostly in licensing and uh, authorization. But of course, uh, uh, technology would, uh, um, tools uh, would uh, very much help in, in uh, when we have uh, Radio Planner, uh, uh, GIS database um, uh, and other, other tools like that to to test some some uh, in our in our labs some some new new features. I I also would like to give more thoughts on the five G questions, but maybe we can I can do that later. So uh, I don't recall all the technologies. I'm sorry, I don't recall all the technologies that were listed uh, in that uh, poll. Uh, but I think that, uh, at least in the U.S., our uh, licensing system is uh, quite advanced and uh, sophisticated, though we always are trying to uh, make it more accessible and easier to use for uh, licensees and others. Uh, I think that uh, what the industry has done in response to uh, the Commission's order in the CBRS proceeding, where we basically uh, introduced dynamic spectrum sharing, has been uh, impressive, and I think that it can be used in other areas. Uh, a third area where I think technology has been uh, extremely important has been in the area of uh, auction design and developing uh, 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 innovative and sophisticated uh, incentive auction uh, mechanisms that will create uh, incentives for incumbents to uh, give up spectrum in re return for some payment so that higher value users can then uh, uh, use the spectrum. And this is a way that we really do want to make sure that uh, spectrum goes to the highest value user. Related to the incentive auction issue, uh, and something that we're going to have to be dealing is with is as you repurpose spectrum, in some cases you may have to repack it. And it turns out that repacking can be an extremely uh, uh, complex operations research problem. In fact, it uh, is viewed as, in some cases, NP complete, which means that you can't come up with an exact solution. So I think that's an area as well where uh, regulators are going to be relying on technology to help make efficient decisions. Great, thank you. So, Jennifer, what, what, this demand for regulatory um, use of technology, what should they be doing? Well, you know, I mean, I've already kind of covered it with, uh, you know, the examples of what we're doing um, at 3.5 as well as 6 gigahertz and, you know, looking forward to other frequency bands, including more um, government spectrum from 3.1 to 3.45 or 3.55, I should say, in the United States. 12 gigahertz in the U.S. is another example. 3.8 to 4.2 um, worldwide. 
Um, but that um, <clears throat> secondary market technology that I was uh, talking about, I think could be really useful for um, existing uh, mobile broadband uh, frequencies where not all of the spectrum is being fully utilized and others might want to get access uh, to it, uh, sort of building on what Ofcom has done uh, for a variety of um, its mobile bands. Uh, automating that capability, creating a marketplace where people can efficiently see what's available, apply for it, and uh, see what the terms are uh, from different licensees um, and what prices are available. Um, I think that would help get the regulator out of the middle of having to negotiate these types of arrangements. It would make it much more efficient and see a significantly um, uh, higher use of those frequencies as a result of the automation. Great, thanks, Jennifer. Mahanid, I just wonder whether um, uh, trying to get as many different things uh, squeezed in here in the context of what more could regulators do. Um, uh, one of the questions we've had from the audience um, is regarding uh, sharing in areas that need the most help and could these areas be held back? So this is thinking about rural areas, poor connectivity. Could they be held back by overcomplicating this process, uh, trying to seek perfection in sharing rather than just doing it simply? Um, what thoughts you had on that from the sort of satellite perspective and what the regulator should be doing? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'll, I'll try and uh, attempt to, to answer the, the question. Uh, and in particular, uh, include the element of what regulators could do. Um, if we go to the nitty gritty side of things, if you like, if um, when you're deploying or overhauling the spectrum uh, to be used by a new technology such as 5G, what do you do with the incumbents uh, providers, uh, in this case, the FSS? Well, there are different scenarios being played out in the US or in Europe. Um, we, we, we've seen what is happening in the US where there has been some degree of, of coordination with, with, the, with the incumbents and uh, mitigation techniques have been produced in order to provide that coexistence, whether it's uh, providing filters, uh, some sort of frequency separation, but also a geographical separation in order to, when you know where the, the terminals are, to, to protect them. Uh, when it comes to, to, to European side of things, uh, again, there, if you look, there are two uh, key elements of interference that are being caused to FSS earth station receivers, in the particular in the, in the C-band. Uh, one is to do with incoming uh, 5G signals that saturate uh, the LNAs or LNBs, uh, driving it out of its dynamic uh, operational range. Um, and in order to compensate for that, I think regulators in Europe um, ha it hasn't been taken into account in the framework that they've harmonized to use um, C-band for 5G is that uh, filters um, need to be included as part of the mitigation techniques uh, to protect the FSS uh, signals. The other element of interference is the outer band emissions or the spurious emissions from these 5G base stations that are actually passing on to the upper um, bands which are being provided to use by FSS receivers. And I think there, uh, from a regulatory perspective, um, better coordinating of the power levels of these 5G masks uh, in order to ensure that coordination between uh, FSS receivers and 5G can coexist. At the end of the day, everybody wants to ensure that technologies are uh, able to provide services and innovation is able to continue, such as 5G um, technology. But it has to be done in a balanced way uh, in a way that takes into account the incumbent services and does not impede on them. Thank you. Sure. Oh, um, uh, Don, you sort of quickly come back on that and then yeah, we'll go over to you, Costa. Um, uh, the comments on the satellite raised two issues that I think are probably worth uh, uh, highlighting. Uh, one is that satellite presents some unique problems because uh, satellite licensees have uh, joint rights to spectrum bands, and that creates real problems if you're trying to induce them to sort of move or give up their rights because there are always problems of coordination, holdup problems, that kind of thing. And that was one of the uh, issues that we confronted in the C-band proceeding. Uh, we eventually were able to and this again was a case where 
technology has improved uh, so greatly uh, that uh, we were able to uh, conclude that uh, the satellite C-band providers could uh, move over 200 megahertz and still provide all the services they are currently providing. Now, the second comment that you made that I think is uh, uh, important is your comment about uh, receivers uh, uh, receiving interference. And I think that is a, a great problem, but it also highlights, I think, one of the weaknesses uh, uh, in the market today, which is that regulators generally do not regulate receivers, and I'm not saying they should, but there are also not really the incentives in place to for uh, equipment manufacturers to install the filters uh, or other equipment so as to filter out, for example, out of band uh, transmissions. And I think as we use spectrum more intensively, one of the things we should be thinking about is how to persuade uh, receiver manufacturers to improve the quality of their receivers. Great, thanks. Goster, if I could just bring you in there uh, as well for your thoughts. Yeah, just a short comment. Uh, back then to the question on what technologies regulators can use in the future for, for sharing a set of spectrum efficiency. I, I, I agree that all everything that has been mentioned will have to be used one way or another and more. Uh, because we need to further evolve these systems, so whether you talk about uh, DSA, CBRS, uh, LSA, etc. Once you have hospitals operating uh, wirelessly or you have a remote surgery or something, you got to make sure that all of those databases controlling the sharing of the spectrum are as <laughs> trustworthy, if you wish, as they can be. Uh, otherwise, we are running into a mess. So the, there, there is a need for further development, further research in all aspects of spectrum sharing, support for spectrum sharing. And we could use blockchains or something just to make sure that nothing is uh, disturbed in the system and that there are no, uh, how shall I say, someone stealing your spectrum without any rights to do it, etc. So there are a lot of things that has to be done. Uh, Great, also, you. I'd like to say just a quick word. If I can hope for something for the future, it's peace on Earth and satellites together. <laughs> we, we really need to come together, and we have this tendency to end up in one end of the room each or the ring. Uh, if we could just meet together somewhere in the, I think there's a lot of things we can do, including better receivers. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Maro. Can you play UN peacekeeper in that role? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, uh, everything is at peace already. Uh, no, I want to take the, the chance uh, of a question from uh, the audience regarding 5G to uh, put another uh, an extra dimension of complexity complexity in in the in the broader picture that worries us as regulators. I mean, uh, now with with technology, some uh, uh, issues like uh, uh, sharing, leasing, and uh, access agreements are have all um, have their boundaries uh, blurred. So it is not easy to distinguish what, what is exactly uh, what the difference is between an access agreement and and a sharing agreement. I mean, if you two operators decided to put together uh, all the spectrum chunks in a given band, uh, compared with the situation where one uh, give all access in a, in an area where the other doesn't have a spectrum almost the same thing, but it's treated with different uh, uh, code uh, provision. And uh, um, when we introduce 5G, uh, situation can become even more complicated because uh, with 5G, you can uh, define a slice and uh, dedicate a slice to a, 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 pl a player or a service. For example, two operators can put together their um, spectrum in different bands, say a mid band and a lower band, then make uh, two or three slice, slices. For example, one dedicated to massive um, type communication, uh, uh, IoT, massive IoT, another dedicated to EMBB, 
and then uh, divide the slice between themselves. So uh, it's a, a DSS within a, a sharing, uh, within a, an access agreement, and uh, um, it's a very complicated. So uh, th that's why I said before that I don't want to uh, di dictate the rules. Uh, the rules should be uh, flexible, uh, especially when we issue rights of use for, um, at the beginning, because we have to leave market players uh, the flexibility to choose their the, the, um, the, the, what is best for, for the market and the, the situation at hand. And we have to intervene uh, to check competition issues, of course, and also exposed eventually. So it's uh, an interesting uh, time that we have uh, in front of us. Absolutely. No, th thank you very much, Mara. Um, I'm going to super quickly um, just give everyone the results of another of the polls. And I think this is very interesting. This is about where the biggest challenges for spectrum sharing will be in the next five years. And it's pretty even. We asked people about satellite and mobile. 29% said that. Uh, another 31% said government and military. Then between countries was 16. DTT mobile, 14%. And science use commercial, 10%. So broadly, the challenges are everywhere. Um, on that note, if I could just ask each panelist and uh, if you can give me a one word answer or potentially a sentence, <laughs> no more than a sentence, because Dan will be very unhappy with me later on. Um, what's the one technology or thing you would uh, in spectrum management across you know, regulators everywhere? We're not you have such divine power. I'll That's start. Pretty... You're right. <laughs> so, uh, John, do you want to go first? Yeah. I'll repeat the question. Please. Yeah. Um, if you could change if you could change one um, technology or aspect of spectrum management in the future everywhere, what would it be? <laughs> go on then, Mohamed, you can go first. Oh, go on then, Gosta, you go first and we'll go around. One word or sentence. Yep, go on then, Mara. Do you, do you want me to go first or? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes, no, just just uh, uh, j joking, uh, answering by joking. I would I would uh, uh, put uh, spectrum management in the hands of uh, uh, engineers more than uh, lawyers and uh, economists. Uh, because uh, I mean, uh, and, uh, first uh, we uh, have to check whether uh, engineers can uh, take uh, legally sound decisions and also efficient decisions. Okay, this is for granted. But I mean, uh, I would like to avoid the, the, um, the struggle for efficiency. I mean, uh, uh, efficiency for the sake of efficiency. That would, I would change uh, for the future. Uh, something uh, uh, that um, should work in practice, uh, taking care of the legacy is best, uh, is better than uh, following uh, the star uh, of efficiency. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Um, just just uh, follow on. Do you want you from, want? Okay, oh, go on. Just quickly, just follow on from what my, my colleague was saying. I, I completely agree. If you put it in the hands of engineers, and with the benefit of hindsight, I would say uh, revising the entire Article Five of the IT frequency allocation table uh, to take into account, you know, uh, the improvement in technologies and what we can do. It's an impossible task, I know, but it would solve so many problems. Fantastic. Uh, Don? So I think that in general, uh, both regulators, uh, providers, and equipment manufacturers have uh, incentives uh, to adopt the appropriate technology to meet the particular needs. Uh, and that we are doing so uh, quickly and getting generating results. Uh, as I mentioned, the one area where I'm a bit concerned is I'm not sure that the same incentives are uh, present to improve receivers. And I think that we do want to be doing that so that we can get the greatest use out of the uh, existing limited uh, spectrum. Good point. Uh, Jennifer and then Gosta. Thanks, Chris. Um, I think uh, the one word answer I would give is automation. 
I think that automation really holds um, uh, a lot of promise for regulators to have to, uh, you know, to be able to cease a very manual, laborious, time consuming process. Um, and that with uh, accurate information and automation, we can um, make far more efficient use of the spectrum and um, enable a whole bunch of uh, use cases and applications that, um, uh, that are uh, you know, uh, currently pent up, looking for access. Fantastic. No, that's me. Okay, uh, I would like to find a way to uh, get rid of all the most obsolete technologies in, in the spectrum those that have been around forever. And if you think about it, Marconi communicated over the Atlantic when he was 20 years old, about 120 years ago, but he was alone. There was no interference. And if he had had a license, he would still be blocking us all. So it's one nice way to get rid of the really old stuff and there'll be lots of place for all of us. Thank you. Good point. Justin. Brilliant. Well, look, um, thank you very much. It's been absolutely fascinating. I wish we had a bit more time. Um, we've run over by just two or three minutes, Dan, so I hope that's okay. So thank you all very much, and I will hand over to Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, thank you all so much, Chris. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that, and to all our panelists as well. And uh, yeah, I think that really was a, uh, a really interesting, really interesting panel. So I think we could have gone on for a lot longer there. But um, yeah, apologies, we didn't have uh, any more time to go on. And apologies to uh, to some of you out there. I know there were lots of questions, and we managed to get in a few of those, but didn't get round to to all of those. Um, but if your question didn't get asked, then uh, you can uh, reach out to the speakers direct using the direct message function uh, that we have on the platform. So if you click on the attendees list tab on the right of your screen, uh, then you can ask the, uh, the your questions to the speakers direct for that. And also don't forget that you will all have the opportunity later on today at the end of the session today to bring your video feed actually live and come up and give your thoughts on the discussions that have taken place in this panel and as well as the thoughts that will take place the discussion sorry that will take place in the the panel we have coming up on six gigahertz so you have the opportunity to do that during the have your say session at the end of the day so please do look out for that and that'll be a chance maybe to come and discuss some of the issues that uh, that we've been looking at looking at today but for now you have uh, just about 20 minutes or so to to draw breath uh or maybe more accurately to, to explore the site, explore the platform, and particularly to, uh, to make use of the networking and the expo areas of the site. Um, so both these areas are now open, uh, and it's definitely worth checking them out, not only because uh, it's a good way to engage with attendees and to network, but it also could win you an iPad. Um, so for those of you who weren't with us yesterday, and as a reminder to those of you who were, um, you can't, we are gonna be giving away an iPad, uh, which will be, be done in the, the closing reception on the, the last day of the event on Monday. So all you need to do to, uh, to be entered into that draw is to visit each of the exhibition stands at some point during the event. And now is a good time. I know some of our exhibitors are uh, going to be live uh, on their stand now to answer questions and with debates and things going on as well. So uh, please do check those out. And also use the networking part of the platform. So you can click on the networking area on the left-hand side of your screen um, to then go and make five new connections. So connect with new people, meet new people, and uh, potentially win an iPad as well. So 20 minutes or so for that. So we're going to be back at around about half past for the next panel. But for now, enjoy the networking, enjoy the expo area, and uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you back here on the stage in 20 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>